Marge Potasek was searching for the purpose of her life and the truth that would tie everything together to make sense of what was taught and what was happening on our planet. The fire that was creating all the smoke. Through many experiences, she was finally led to the knowledge book that provided all the answers. She is now talking about this gift to humanity on Knowledge Book Radio, so all can be united in peace, love, and harmony. Please call one 973 787-7035 or email mmjp99 at gmail.com with questions. If you send your postal address to mmjp99 at gmail.com, you will receive three chapters of the knowledge book as a gift. Now, here is your host, Marge Potasek. Hello, everyone. I'm Marge Potasek, and you're listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Potasek on Transformation Talk Radio. For the next hour, as we have been for a while now, we will continue our series of what are called Omega Talks or Omega Conferences. These are given once a month on the fourth Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time and 7 p.m. East Coast Time. Now, the Omega Talks themselves are part of the unification program of the Call to Friendship Association that's mentioned in the Knowledge Book several times. And what's happening, or one of the things that's happening in these talks is that we are connecting world knowledge, some topic that we choose or someone suggests, and we connect this knowledge to the Omega dimension which is also known as the Union of Central Suns, also the 19th dimension. Now, we were given access to many dimensions. However, the 19th dimension has been only open to humanity at the beginning of the 20th century and is coming in from the knowledge book, through the knowledge book. Actually, there is one day in a year that Omega Dimension is open completely to the world planet without having been reflected from something else or someone else, and that is on the 21st of June every year. And then we go back to regular reflection through the Knowledge Book and other programs that are going on with the Knowledge Book. So again, this is the first time that the 19th Dimension is being open to humanity. And what we are doing is connecting some world knowledge, unifying this knowledge and unifying humanity at the Omega dimension. So the topic for this month being November, 2022 is octopus and the intellect. So many people would agree that the octopus is one of the most fascinating and strange creatures on the planet. After all, This creature has been evolving for more than half a billion years, that's B for billion, not M for million, but billion years of evolution, and is on a completely different path than the rest of the animals or humans. Even though it's on a different path, and even though it's a mollusk, meaning its relatives are the clam and the um, oyster, It is very intelligent and very resourceful. And that intelligence is actually distributed in a way that is completely different from mammals and humans. Their neurons are distributed throughout their suckers, their arms, their brains. And this is unlike the centralized human brain. We have one human brain that's contained in the head and the skull and it controls all the functions of the body. Now, there are functions that are automatic, like you jerk your hand or body part away from something that's painful, but most of the time, or we don't have to control breathing or heart rate or anything like that, but most of the other conscious actions are done through the brain. It is not as if each one of our arms has a and separate operating system that acts independently of the central nervous system. Now the octopus has three hearts, blue blood, 
its beak is venomous and it has absolutely no bones. And therefore it can squeeze themselves into all kinds of shapes and spaces. They can also change the color as well as the texture of their skin into many different kinds of dazzling colors and patterns. So they really are unlike any other creature on this planet. And this is why, this is the reason why octopuses have long been the subject of mythical tales and urban legends, because they do seem otherworldly. They look like they have magical abilities. And of course, the fact that they live in the ocean, which is a source of mystery to us, that also adds to the mystery of the um, octopus. Now, actually, we only know maybe up to 5% of what's going on in the ocean. Apparently, we know a lot more about the moon, the sun, the stars than we do about the ocean. And we'll be showing through the slides few of the popular depictions from literature, film, and culture that focus on these remarkable cephalopods. So maybe the most famous depiction of the octopus is the kraken. Now this is a legendary giant cephalopod-like sea monster that originated from Scandinavian folklore. Now according to this folklore and the Norse sagas, the kraken lives off the coast of Norway and Greenland and has fun playing tricks on nearby sailors. Now this legend could have originated from maybe someone seeing a giant squid and some squid do grow from 13 to 15 meters, otherwise 40 to 50 feet in length. And because it is so big, now you can imagine that 50 feet, 40, 50 feet is the length of a house. Um, so the sheer size and the width looked fearsome. This had led to the Kraken, a common ocean dwelling monster in various fictional works. Most recently has been seen in Walt Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Chest. And if you remember reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne, there is an octopus-like monster that comes out of the sea and attacks the submarine. And throughout the centuries, the Kraken has been a staple of part and a staple of sailor superstitions and of mythology. So basically it's a myth and a legend and though it may have at one point started in fact, it has become mainly fiction. But octopuses have not always been associated with fear. In many cultures from South America to the Pacific Northwest to the Papal Polynesian islands, octopuses were traditionally revered as divine protectors and spiritual guides. And in fact, there are some traditional beliefs that octopuses control the weather and have the power to heal the sick. Nakika is the ancient octopus god of the Gilbert Islands. And they say that it is he who has helped to build the Pacific Islands. So I guess there is some fear of the divine. However, this is mostly good attributes that are being given to the, uh, to the octopus. In Hawaiian culture, their god Kanaloa would usually take the form of an octopus. And there are even some ancient myths that tell us that our current universe is only a very small part, the only remaining part of a very ancient universe. And that only survivor of that ancient universe is the octopus. And actually when you look at the octopus and the way it's formed and shaped, you can actually maybe believe that this is an alien life form that survived when others couldn't. Now in our current state, in our current world planet, um, scientists predict that the only creature that will survive is the cockroach in case we go and make terrible mistakes, but anyway. So if you want to see a giant squid, that's actually not a very likely thing to happen because sightings are extremely rare. And indeed for hundreds of years, they were considered no more than a myth. 
something of a legend, someone's out of, out of someone's imagination. Though this species was most probably the inspiration for the croc and sea monster, and this sea monster was popularized for the Western world by Sir Alfred Tennyson. And of course, there's a Greek mythology, there's a god called Scylla. Again, has got octopus attributes. But we go from superstitious superstition to actual science. Even though it's mythical, mischievous, misunderstood, and marvelous, it is no surprise that octopuses have captivated human imagination and fueled by fear of the unknown, inspired such storytelling and popularity. So if you look at the picture of the octopus, you can see it's got two eyes, and instead of a nose and a mouth, it's got arms coming out. So if this is a myth and a legend, then it isn't every day that a mystery from the deep swims into plain sight. But this is exactly what happened on December 24th, 2012, when people on a pier in Tayama Bay in central Japan were treated to a rare sight of a giant squid. The creatures swam under fishing boats close to the surface of Tayama Bay, and supposedly he hung around the bay for several hours before it was ushered back to open water. They also were able to capture this creature on video through a submersible camera. And a diver actually came into the water, went into the water and swam along this, along the side the, of this red and white real life sea monster. And of course, now the myth has become reality, so it's no longer a legend, but reality. Well, of course, we all know that an octopus has eight arms. But did you also know that each arm contains its own mini brain? So this, this happens, and this arrangement enables octopuses to complete tasks with their arms more quickly and effectively. Moreover, while each arm can act independently, able to taste, to touch, and to move without direction, they also have a centralized brain that exerts top-down control as well. So arms, the eight arms move, move independently, make decisions independently. However, they do take commands and submit to the control of the central brain. So they're able to prove this fact as that there is a central control for the arms and not only independent arm control through an experiment in 2011. And the researchers tested if an octopus could learn to guide one of its arms through a maze to reach food. Now this maze was tricky because the octopus had to go through a plastic tubing but the plastic tubing had to go, was connected to another piece of plastic tubing, but there is like in the next aquarium, meaning the octopus had to leave the water so it couldn't um, use its arms and its chemical sensors to find the food. But however, because those partitions were transparent, the octopus was able to see where the food is. And eventually most of the octopuses succeeded at guiding their arm to the food, proving that the central brain, which processes visual information, could control the arm. And because they have nine brains, it seems that octopuses have the benefit of both localized and centralized control over their actions. And they're also smart enough to figure out how to work the maze to get what they need and what they want. So these guys are seriously clever. And scientists usually gauge intelligence based on the size of the animal's brain in relation to its body. And this kind of arrangement gives them an indication of how much an animal is investing in its brain. It's not a perfect measure because there are other factors to brain intelligence, such as how many folds there are in the brain 
and something and the arrangement of the brain and the size of the different um, brain lobes. But smarter animals tend to have a higher brain to body ratio. An octopus's brain to body ratio is the largest of any invertebrate. So he's got the biggest brain relative to its body. It is also larger than many vertebrates, meaning those animals with backbones and bones, though it's not bigger than the mammals. However, octopuses have about as many neurons as a dog. So that would make them pretty intelligent. If you are in contact with dogs, you, can, you know that dogs can do lots of things and they're very smart. So the common octopus has around 500 million and two thirds of the 500 million are in its arms. The rest are in the donut shaped brain, which is wrapped around the esophagus and located at the octopus head. So, oh, I don't have a, there we go. So this is the centralized brain that's around the esophagus. And this is an optic lobe. So they show that they were intelligent in many ways. And in experiments, they've solved mazes and completed tricky tasks to get food rewards. They're also adept at getting themselves in and out of containers. So in a laboratory where octopuses were being held, fish started to disappear overnight. So the staff would close the lab for the night and keep fish for feeding whatever laboratory setup they had in a separate tank. But everything will be fine, was fine when they left. But when they came back, the fish were gone. So seeing and trying to figure out what is going on, they set up, up, they set up a little video camera to find out how this was happening. And when they went back, after the video was taken, and that video showed that one of the octopuses was getting out of its tank, going into the other tank by opening it first. It's, it, it ate the fish, then closed the lid after he left and went back to his own tank, tank and hid the evidence. So this guy knew what was going on. He's, you know, 007. But anyway, there is also footage of similar behavior and ingenious problem solving happening in the wild as well. So there is a BBC video that shows a giant Pacific octopus stealing, poaching, using the opportunity that there are crabs inside a crab trap, eating the crab and leaving only the shell behind. And when the fishermen come back to, um, harvest the crab they thought they had um, trapped, only they got, they only have shells to know that there was a crab in there, but somehow Mr. Octopus has come in and eaten it first. Now, believe it or not, but the large Pacific striped octopus, you can see the stripes on his head here. They use scare tactics when they hunt for dinner. So it creeps up to its prey, let's say a shrimp, and taps the shrimp on its shoulder with one of its arms. When the shrimp gets shocked or startled that someone has tapped it on the shoulder and sees an arm on his shoulder or behind his shoulder, it jumps away from that arm. However, it goes straight into the other seven arms and opens open mouth of the waiting octopus. And at that point, it's good to have seven additional arms just in case the shrimp would like to and probably would go do all kinds of tricks to be able to escape. Now, tales of escape aren't merely confined to aquariums. There is one viral internet video that shows a very large octopus squeezing itself through a hole on a ship in order to return to the safety of the ocean. And there's also a story or a tale 
that's pretty well known of an octopus that escaped the deck of a trawler in the English Channel. Now, what this guy did was he managed to slip out of the net that was left on the desk, deck, sorry. They, he slithered down into the cabin of the ship and hours later, the sailors found him hiding in a teapot. So not only can get through small places, but they can fit into very small places. And if you look on the internet, there are several stories about octopuses escaping from their tanks and aquariums around the world. The most popular story is the story of Inky. Now this guy escaped from New Zealand Aquarium back in 2016, and he succeeded in making a dash for freedom by breaking out of his tank after he lid, after the lid was left partially open on his tank. Now he went across the aquarium floor and down a 50 meter drain pipe, that's 160 feet drain pipe to the sea. There've also been several stories of octopuses climbing out of their tanks and into neighboring tanks and aquariums, often in search for food they've spotted through the glass. And Walt Disney's, I think it's Finding, um, Finding Dory, there are scenes in there of octopuses coming out of the tank and, and helping Dory and other and the fish to escape from their aquariums. I don't think that's in Finding Nemo, I think it's in Finding Dory. And interestingly enough, they can also use tools. Now, tool use is relatively rare in the animal kingdom. And tool use is usually associated with higher life forms like apes, monkeys, dolphins, and some birds like crows and parrots. So this use of tools is a good indicator of the ability to learn. And among invertebrates, only octopuses and a few insects are known to use tools. So besides being able to solve tasks using tools to get food rewards in the lab, in the wild octopuses have also shown the ability to, to build little dens and to use stones to create shields to protect the entrance. So they pile anything they can find, rocks, broken shells, even broken glass and bottle caps. So this becomes a means for them to protect themselves and to shield predators from seeing and entering their um, hiding place. Now here's an interesting use of tools. The Portuguese man of war has tentacles that carry a very potent and painful venom. So it's painful to get stung by a Japanese man of war tentacle. However, there is a common blanket octopus, it's what's his name? It's immune to the venom. So what it does is it harvests the uh, tentacles from the Portuguese man of war and uses that to inflict effects on unwitting predators of prey. And the most impressive and convincing example, according to scientists, of tool use by octopuses came in 2009, when a few vein octopuses were observed collecting discarded coconut shells in Indonesia. So these guys, after they dug up the shells, they washed them very clean with jets of water and then they carry them to a new location and assemble them as a shelter. As you can see in this slide here, you have coconut shells with the octopus inside. They also traveled with these shells under their body. And when they did that, this kind of resulted in a stilt walk along the seafloor. So most of the arms were used in holding the um, coconut shell under their body and they left like two arms to actually walk along the seabed. Now, although this exposes the octopus body to predators, however, it looks like they were willing to accept the short-term risk for future protection. Scientists also, also discovered the behavior that this behavior of storing and keeping 
the um, octopus shells, I mean, the, the coconut shells, that there are, that this in fact is an actual true and conclusive evidence of genuine tool use. So not only do you have something in your surrounding that you're using because it's there, but it's another thing to actually take something, put it somewhere else and use it in a different way or multiple ways later on. So they have very large optic globes as we saw in the brain um, picture a few slides back, they have very large optic globes. And these are the areas of the brain that's dedicated to vision so we know that this, the, his eyes or the octopus's eyes are very important in their life. And they look like they can recognize individuals out of their own, not, not of their own species, including human faces. Now, Scientific American, which is a magazine, monthly magazine, reported a story from New Zealand where octopuses who were captive somehow for some reason took a dislike to one of the staff and every time the person passed the tank the octopus squirted a jet of water at her so for some reason the octopus recognized this woman and when she walked past she got a shower so the biologists because they saw this did an experiment for two weeks they were playing their version of good cop bad cop or nice cop nice person mean person, meaning they one would one staff member would feed the octopuses and the other staff member would scratch the octopuses. At the end of this experiment, the octopuses behave differently to the nice keeper and the mean one. And of course, this confirmed for the scientists that octopuses could distinguish between two individuals because these individuals who fed the octopuses and scratched the octopuses, the only difference between them was actually their faces and their heads because they wore identical uniforms. So the only distinguishing feature was the face itself. So if they were nice to the nice um, individual, that means they recognize that nice individual through their face. They also have very cunning disguises and escape techniques. Octopuses are probably the world's most skilled camouflage artists. They have thousands of specialized cells under their skin, which are called chromatophores. And this helps them to change color in an instant. And they blend into their surroundings. Now, besides this, they have something they call populate. And these are tiny areas of the skin that can be expanded or contracted or retracted to rapidly change the texture of their skin to match their surroundings. So if they're on a smooth surface, a smooth brown surface, then the octopus will turn smooth and brown. However, if their background is, um, let's say, a rock that's formed of, let's say, a sedimentary rock where they've got kinds of small pebbles inside of a matrix, then they will turn their skin to that kind of texture and that kind of color. And I don't know whether you can see where the octopus begins and the surrounding starts. All I can see is that this is their entrance for the gills where they suck in, you know, take in water in and out their breathing tubes. But where the rest of it comes and goes, I have no idea. Okay, not only do they blend with the surroundings, there are also octopuses called the mimic octopuses. Now these were discovered in 1998 in Indonesia. So this one doesn't copy surrounding rocks, reefs and seaweed like the other octopuses, but instead they disguise themselves as other animals that predators tend to avoid. So, like he wouldn't go and attack an anemone because it is surrounded by the poisonous uh, anemone. I mean, anemone fish, but anyway. Um, so what they do is they contort their body 
arranging its arms and modifying its behavior so it can look like and turn into a wide variety of venomous animals like lionfish, like banded sole and sea snakes among the, are among the ones that impersonates. So the top picture here could be the lionfish. This is the um, banded sole. And this is the sea snake. And when it swims, it actually looks like a snake is swimming. And the scientists also are beginning to believe that the mimic octopus chooses a creature to impersonate based on what's living in the area. And they choose to mimic that animal that represents the greatest threat to its potential predator. And when a mimic octopus was attacked, was attacked by a territorial damselfish, for example, it disguised itself as one of their predators, a banded sea snake. So it's very target specific as to what he turns into based on what he's seeing. In 2005, researchers reported another cutting solution for moving away from danger without breaking the camouflage illusion. In other words, if you're blending into the algae, you become an algae and then you don't break that camouflage because well, you put your arms underneath all of them, all six of them, and the remaining two you use to walk. Meantime, you're also looking like an algae. So you had, there's an algae that's drifting along the bottom of the seafloor. And this is actually the first example of bipedal locomotion under the sea. Two tropical octopuses were found to lift six of their arms and walk backwards on the other two. So again, as I mentioned, this allowed the algae octopus to keep its other arms extended and maintain its appearance of algae even while moving. Meanwhile, the veined octopus walked with six of its arms curled under its body, possibly to appear like a coconut rolling along the seafloor, and both were able to move faster than their usual many arm curl. So if you remember seeing octopuses, they kind of go along, their suckers going ahead and then pulling themselves forward, but on the two legs they were able to, or actually two arms, they were able to um, move more quickly. Now, interestingly enough, everything that was known about octopuses is that they are very solitary creatures. They don't go around in groups or even partners. They, they are very solitary. They hunt alone. They live alone. However, in 2012, scientists made a surprising discovery in Jarvis Bay, Australia. And supposedly this solitary gloomy octopus started to build underwater cities. And these were congregations of dens formed from rock outcrops and discarded piles of shells from the clams and scallops the octopuses had feasted on. Now, the population size of the octopus city is certainly not up to the, our normal city standards that may hold millions of people because the, um, Octopus City had only about 15 occupants living in what they called Octopolis. And apparently there was a second nearby octopus commune they called Octlantis, and they studied this in 2017. But it turns out that they are far higher than scientists anticipated based on their loner reputation. So here we have octopuses living in a group. Now, being in a city, it has its advantages and drawbacks. So what they saw was frequent aggression, chases and even den evictions among the octopuses living at Atlantis. So the researchers don't really know why and what the benefits are of living in a densely populated settlement, but it may be just a case of necessity because Space is becoming limited and dens therefore are becoming limited. So you begin to start sharing an area together because that's all you've got to live in. And of course, 
we have the octopus that has the blue blood. And this is due to their blood molecule or their blood cell that contains hemo, that's called hemokyanin. And this carries oxygen to the octopus, but it, octopus's body, just like hemoglobin carries oxygen in our bodies. However, hemokyanin contains copper and not iron. And it turns out that this copper-based protein is actually more efficient at transporting oxygen molecules in cold and low oxygen conditions. So it's perfectly suited for the octopus living in that deep ocean um, area. And interestingly enough, even though our blood becomes what we call blue or becomes darker in color, um, when the octopus's blood becomes deoxygenated, it loses its blue color and turns clear instead. And interestingly enough, it not only has one, but it has three hearts. And each heart has a little different role. One heart circulates blood around the body, while the other two pump it past the gills to pick up oxygen. So it's allocated two, two hearts, I guess one for each gill and one for each, each intake um, tube or gill, I mean, sorry, one each for, I guess you would call it nostrils and that opening into the gills. Now, this is a very interesting creature. This, when you look at this mollusk, when you look at this octopus, it looks like somebody was playing games on Photoshop and put this together based on their imagination. And here you can see again how the octopus's head looks like an alien head, but anyway. Now the glowing sucker octopus is found in the North Atlantic, both Eastern and Western parts of the Atlantic, the Northern Atlantic. It is there between 50 to 4,000 meters. Now it's that 1,600 to 13,000 feet. Now 13,000 feet, that's, that's over two miles about two and a half miles. And this is a zone in the ocean that actually has no light. Now this octopus itself is not one of those giants. It's only about five to 10 centimeters or two to four inches and seems to be fairly common off the edge of the continental shelf on the Eastern coast of the United States. But what is really nice about this and alluring about this species is that it has light emitting suckers that glow in the dark. Now the glowing sucker octopus, each arm has about 40 suckers that lost their typical ability to attach. So they don't, they're not able to hold on to anything with those suckers. Instead, they have evolved to be light producing organs. And the main function of bioluminescence in the glowing sucker octopus seems to be a combination of both attracting prey and scaring of predators. So if any of you have seen, any of you have seen um, fish with attachments of you know, glowing bioluminescence, they use it as a lure to attract prey. But in this case, it looks like it's both a scare tactic and, um, and food attraction tactic. Now we've covered all kinds of things that they can do, but the question still remains, can they remember? Do they have anything like a short-term memory, a long-term memory? Um, some people say that they have no memory at all, that it's terrible. Other people say that it's excellent. So basically, here we go again, a, experiment had been devised where they tested for memory in the octopus. So they, into a tank, they put in a transparent, four transparent tubes. And it was stabilized by a partition connected to a partition. And where those tubes opened was only a hole. Now, that divider prevented the octopus from seeing what was on the other side. However, they could only see the holes 
and each of which of those holes opened up into a tube. Now one fish was placed in one end of the tube, in one tube. The holes were large enough to allow the octopus to fit an arm through and through it in order to retrieve the food. However, it was small enough to prevent him from seeing it. So he could sense it through their arms, but not with their eyes. So the octopus had to insert an arm in the tube to explore its contents. And that's the only way he was able to find the fish. Now this experiment was run for 15 days and they always placed the fish in the same tube to see if the octopus would remember where they usually found the snack. Now when they performed the test, they of course put the food in the same place every time. However, they changed the intervals. So this would test whether how long they were able to remember where the food was. So first interval was an hour. So they put the fish, then an hour later, they would put the fish in, the octopus would eat the fish, and an hour later they would put fish again and see if the octopus would go to the same place that the fish was before. So first interval was an hour, then they did it every day, then they did it every three days, and then 10 days later. And in every case, the octopus was able to remember where his snack was and reached right in. So he didn't experiment and see if the other holes had anything for him. He went exactly into the one where he found it before. So he was able to remember and to learn where that food was. So again, 15 days later, they played a trick on this octopus. They inserted the structure, only this time they didn't put any food in it. So he went straight to the tube where he had the food before, found nothing there. He went through and examined the other tubes, found nothing there, and he was a very unhappy camper when he left. He got tricked. They can also regenerate their arms, the entire arm. And even though each arm has its own mini brain and an extensive network of neurons, healing begins with undifferentiated stem cells and that actually develops into specialized cells such as liver and muscle cells of a new arm. And interestingly enough, this new arm is exactly the same as the old arm was and as fully functional as the old arm was. So that's an interesting thing, maybe we could duplicate it. So as a review, they can recall both short and long-term memories. They successively master mazes with various levels of difficulty with no time at all. They remember locations to find great food and what areas to avoid and escape when they are in captivity. And actually they don't like being in a captivity. Um, and they try to escape. That's why they try to escape. But scientists have found that keeping octopuses in laboratories, in aquariums, they need to be stimulated with some kind of activity. Some have kept themselves um, occupied by plugging up the siphon holes and therefore no water was escaping the tank because it circulated the water in the tank. And basically that caused the the tank to overflow with water. So they kept themselves busy. Other, other people have thrown in empty um, containers into the water and they seem to be playing ping pong with those. And sometimes they would put something in the, um, in the medicine container and the active was, was actually able to open that container and reach get, and get the food. So they're able to determine patterns, to distinguish size, and even to identify colors and shapes. They're able to ind recognize individuals and they're able to solve puzzles through analysis. So these are very smart and intelligent creatures. So the octopus, as we have seen, is a very complicated, intelligent animal. And there are other um, aspects, other characteristics that we did not cover. So the intellect of the octopus brings us to a review of our intellect and how the human evolves with the combination of intellect, logic, and awareness. So let's talk more about our intellect and how the knowledge book 
explains our intellect and how it connects us to universal energy. So let's define intellect first. In the Oxford Languages Dictionary, intellect is defined as the faculty of reasoning and understanding objectively, especially with regard to abstract or academic matters. Now, according to Merriam-Webster, intellect is the power of knowing as distinguished from the power to feel and to will, the capacity for knowledge, the capacity for rational or intelligent thought, especially when highly developed. So this is our definition or world definition of intellect. The knowledge book on the other hand in the glossary defines intellect as the supervising mechanism of the brain and further says that logic is thinking right. Now in fascicle 32, it says, quote, an intellect is doomed to be confused and agitated as long as it does not attain the genuine cognizance. You can never leave the path you believe in or the steps you have taken forward when you become the possessor of genuine cognizance. To grasp the truth is in proportion with the power of the personality and the operations carried out by the advanced consciousness assemblies everyone is in. And this also continues, quote, in fascicle 32, channels are under supervision. There will be difficult examinations to go through if you cannot use your intellect. You may read each knowledge given to your planet. You may receive each message. They may assist you to grasp the truth. However, only the analysis and the synthesis of your intellect will show you the path of truth you will tread. So in every experience, we have a truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. In every experience as a germ for evolution, there's, there's a possibility for evolution in every experience. So you need to be able to analyze what is happening, why it's happening, figure out a reason um, that is happening, and then apply a solution, analyze it, and then synthesize a solution with your life with your personality, with the way you do things and approach things and then test that out and then if it works or not. If you are in the same situation over and over again, that means you're missing the lesson and you have not learned from that lesson. So that lesson is repeated and usually it escalates in difficulty. So only by using our intellect that we're able to analyze and put together, synthesize solutions and travel forward. In fascicle nine, it says, the intellect is the most powerful focal point of the layers of awareness. It is in connection with the universal energy. So intellect connects us to energy. And intellect always commands, that's the guy in charge. This mechanism nearly obsesses the human in question. What is to be done is done and applied. And the triplet of intellect, self-awareness administers all these situations. Now, in essence, in this diagram, you see the energy waves coming in. It's hitting the brain. The brain has the capacity to switch energy and transcribe it as the knowledge will cause it the telex system into ideas, into words, into numbers. And based on those words and numbers, it comes out, basically program us to act in a particular way. So our awareness is connected to the universal energy. Here we go. Universal energy depends on the knowledge you can receive. So it depends on where you are here, how strong your evolution is, how close you are to your essence, and what energy level that you are in, that, that will depend on what energy you can receive. So universal energy depends on the knowledge you can receive. The knowledge that we can receive depends on the dimension that we are in. So if we are in the world dimension, which is basically us being in kindergarten, um, because we come in at zero world, zero frequency, third evolution level. 
So we come into this planet geared for evolution, geared for growth, both bodily and spiritually and intellectually. So if we're at the world level, then we're only able to receive world knowledge. And therefore, we'll be only getting ideas about what to do in the world, meaning we'll be protecting, number one, ourselves, and acting in such a way that protects ourselves and enables us to get the food and shelter and make sure that we continue to exist. So that depends if, however, you're on, let's say, a religious dimension, um, which is like the seventh dimension, then you're able to absorb the energies of that seventh dimension here. You will get information, knowledge from that dimension, transform that knowledge or those energies into ideas that only are in the seventh dimension and therefore are acting in a way that we are programmed to act based on the dimension that we are in. And the dimension that we are in depends on our evolution level. So we start out, as I said, in zero frequency, third evolution dimension. That's our starting point. And slowly over time, we get different energies. We get different influences. You have different experiences. And we process that information using our intellect and are able to then experience the experiences that we need to be able to progress on the evolutionary path. And depending on the dimension that we're in, again, we're able to absorb certain energies. Those energies allow us to have certain thoughts. And then those thoughts are usually put into action, okay? And everything, everything depends on the purity of your essence, the scantiness of the ego. So we start out with, big ego, protecting ourselves, protecting number one, ourselves, and making sure everything works and functions so that we continue to survive and exist. However, over time, we learn to take care of others. So a major part of that is basically taking care of our family, taking care of our children, taking care of our parents, and basically allowing us to grow in evolution, lessening of our ego and being able to take care of others. And when we are able to think of others before ourselves, that's when the knowledge book says that we are conscious and that we are at the dimension that we're supposed to be as far as humans are supposed to be in this time and age. So we are in a new age where energies are coming in Now, there is one beautiful thing that I need to mention, and that is this. Right now, all kinds of energies are coming in, and those energies that we cannot handle fall on us kind of like rain on or hail on a tin roof. The hail or the rain cannot penetrate the tin roof. It bounces off of it. It makes lots of noise. So basically, that may be a large part of the depressions that we feel because we feel that pressure of energy coming in. However, we're not able to absorb it. So what the knowledge book has, and it has a beautiful mechanism called the light photon cyclone technique. And basically it has all the frequencies, all the dimensions represented in that book and it's contained in that book plus access to infinite dimensions. And what the book does is, is allow you to be protected from any energies that are higher than you are at that particular point in time. And it gives us the energies that we need at that particular point in time to allow us to continue on our evolution level. Now, there is one thing we need to remember. Every dimension we go through and every evolutionary step we go through, every dimension has its own knowledge, its own energy, its own frequency, and its own guardian and teacher. So at every step of the way, we have access to a guardian and a teacher whose job is to make sure you get through that evolutionary level, go through that dimension and learn the lessons you need to learn and absorb the energies you need to absorb to continue forward and onward. 
So that that guardian's that spiritual guardian's job is to make sure that you go through each dimension successfully, and then the next guardian on the next dimension takes over. However, you get tested first, just like you need to pass an exam to get from kindergarten, actually not from first grade to second grade or from second grade to third grade or to college or to high school, whatever you're going for, you need to pass a test. So if you've successfully completed a dimensional work, then the next dimension takes over and the next guardian takes over. And then you get the energies little by little through a gradual process, you're able to absorb those energies and um, able to function based on that knowledge that you're receiving. So you'll always be getting messages. You'll always be getting energies from the dimension you're in. Your brain has the capacity to take in that energy, transform it to ideas, transform it to words, and we're able to both act and talk and think based on that energy input. And the knowledge book has this light photon cyclone technique that protects us from any energy that could harm us. And that does it through reading the knowledge book, through working that with the um, programs of the knowledge book. And they, the programs of the knowledge book are specifically designed to allow us to gradually, safely, and quickly go through our evolutionary steps to wind up at the 19th dimension, the omega dimension. And that makes us genuine humans, and that makes us um, eligible to go to the advanced dimensions. And it looks like this is the only the time we have for today. So I'd like to state um, and give you information about the websites. So the Turkish main website is DK, www.dkb, David Kite Boy, dash revlana.org.tr. The United States website is www.usa.theknowledgebook, all one word, dot net. The Call to Friendship website is www.calltofriendship, all one word, dot org. If you have any questions or discussion points or some topics that you would like me to cover in these talks, then please call me at 973-787-7035. Again, 973-787-7035. Or email me at mmjp99 at gmail.com. That is Mar Mary Mary John Peter 99 at gmail.com. So I look forward to um, getting information from you or feedback from you. And um, please remember that the knowledge book is here to help us evolve and to grow and to become genuine humans. We'll see you next time and thank you. You've been listening to Knowledge Book Radio with Marge Patasic. Marge was led to the Knowledge Book, a gift to humanity at its time of transition to the golden age that provides the truth, energies, and knowledge. Now, she shares information from and answers questions about the Knowledge Book with you the fourth Tuesday each month at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information, visit usa.theknowledgebook.net and tune in next time for another amazing show on Knowledge Book Radio.